That is a good question. What does the wine mean to me? Wine is, I, let's put it that way, wine accompanies human civilization since there is human civilization. Wine is cultural heritage, wine is gift from God, wine is legacy. And um, wine is totally different from any other drink. When you invite guests to your home and um, they enjoy the wine, then you are proud to have chosen the right bottle. If they don't enjoy the wine, then you tell your wife, I knew that this wine is far too good for these people. Yeah? That is a kind of reaction you would never have with any liquor or beer or whatsoever. Yeah? So it's a personal emotion. Yeah? And wine is emotion. And that's why the reason why we all like to drink wine, to experience wine, because we learn and we know exactly that wine has a totally different identity in history. And to me, it's very important. When uh, I like history, I think um, we all should know where our roots are, we should know where we come from. And so is with wine. When, you see, when, when I go back in history, and uh, when I open the, the Bible and the Gospel, they're from the first to the last page, it's wine talk. Yeah? Uh, the first thing Noah did after the Great Flood, he planted a vineyard. Why did he plant a vineyard? Yes, he could have done, he, he could have, uh, could have uh, made a diary farm or something. No, he planted a vineyard. Yeah, so it's, it is important because it's always, it, it interacts our doing here with the blessing from Lord himself. I think that's very important. Or another example, when in the gospel, when Jesus went public, so the first miracle that is reported from Jesus Christ was not the healing of the wounded or, or people that had uh, physical or mental problems. No, it was the wedding of Canaan. And why is that in the, in the Gospel of St. John? Why is that reported as the first miracle? My explanation is because it, that story attracted attention to the public, to the audience. Yeah? So, wow! Wow, someone was able to turn water into wine. Let's listen what he has to tell. And, and this is just something to say. But when we go to the, to the old Egyptian culture, yes? for example, people, in the, people were drinking red wine, but the pharaoh was drinking white wine. That could be seen from the, from the uh, tomb of Tutankhamun, yeah? and <laughs> this young king who passed away at the age of 19 years old, yes, they, they found remnants of white wine in, in, in his tomb chamber. Or when we go to the old uh, Sumer culture in Iraq nowadays, in Mesopotamia, wine, yeah, wherever we go, wine. To the, in the Black Sea cultures, the old uh, country cultures, which is now Georgia there, wine, yeah, everywhere is wine. And I think that's so important. And to me, wine is part of my um, family identity, wine is the history of the landscape I come from, and um, there is so much knowledge and wisdom involved, from, given from one generation to the next. So I think that's really important to learn about wine, to learn no more, as people who like to drink wine are always people who are really savvy and interested and go a step forward. As most white wines, gains its elegance by the long vegetation season and not a hot, short a growing time. And uh, subsequently, we have got the model country, climatic-wise, to grow these refined, versatile and sometimes fragile white wines. Apart from that, we grow grapes on um, slate stone, Devonian slate stone. That is a stone that was created uh, some 500 million years ago. It's not a grown rock, but a sedimented rock. It was created under huge tropical sea, 
For millions of years, the sea mud has been pressed to ground. And when the landscape was built, as we know today, the shift of the continent, some of these layers were brought up, came to surface and created the Renanian Slate Mountains. And um, it is very easy for the plants to penetrate the terroir, the soil, and take out nutrition. Yeah? And that is very mineral driven. So we have coolish climate, warmish but coolish climate. We have got uh, slate stone, uh, the terroir, and that ends up in a, in, with, with a low pH level in the wine. And as we have got uh, the long vegetation season, all Rieslings, and that is something really special with the Riesling from Germany, are driven by tartaric acid. The longer the grapes ripen on the wine, the more delicate and the higher the finesse in the acidity. And uh, so Riesling is something that is seen from the backbone taste. And my duty as the wine grower is to produce wines taste around that dry lingering finish. That is the secret of Riesling production. And particularly in the United States, uh, people like acid, subsequently Mosels are so much distributed in this country. The, the other reason why we are successful in producing Riesling in Germany is that a kind of German character is precision. And if you want to make a top Riesling wine, you have to do it with precision. It's not the art, other than other grape varieties, some other grape varieties, to make a blend. In white, a flying winemaker with his special cellar recipes, take a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, mix it, and then you have a nice brand. No, it is precision. Show back the fruit on a given spot, picked at a certain time, back into the bottle. That is the Riesling story. Cheap Riesling can be simple and sweet, but there is cheap wine everywhere, which has no higher criteria to, to match or to fulfill. So, uh, but the great Riesling wines, of course, they have got residual sweetness, but, uh, but they also can be bone dry. Rieslings have an un uncounted number of faces. They can go from bone dry to super sweet, and everything in between, every step is possible. But what makes it so special is that the sugar that might be in that particular bottle shows on the tongue and on palate in a quite a different way. It is as if you were to bite in a fresh fruit, in an apple, pear, apricot, peach. When you eat that kind of fruit, you never speak of sweetness of that fruit. You just speak how refreshing that fruit is because it is balanced by acid. The same occurs to Riesling. We have uh, initially on the lips, on the tongue, we have some amount of sugar that might be in a lower or in a higher percentage, but it's always balanced against backbone acid. So the wine never tastes sweet, the good Riesling wine, but fruity. And that is terribly important. And that is so important, particularly in the food process, as it helps um, to reanimate your taste buds, to cleanse or to rinse your mouth. It works like a sorbet and it helps to digest. Riesling is the ideal food wine. White wine ages, particularly when it um, has some residual versus acid. What makes the wine aging is not the amount of alcohol. It's the balance of sugar versus acidity. And as the Riesling has got generally most of the sugar, uh, subsequently it can age much better. Yeah? Uh, it provides the acidity is not too low. But good Riesling from the Mosel, from the Nahr, Rheingau, uh, Pfalz have got acidity. Subsequently they age. Um, there are other white wines that age, Chenin Blanc, Bonzo in the Loire, yeah, Vouvray age as well. It's a little bit sim uh, similarity, they have got residual sweetness as well. So it's always that balance that makes the wine age. 
Once these wines start to age, they get more complex. You get much more texture and slowly they start drying out. So a 20 year old wine has no longer the sweetness the wine had when it was young, but it has a lot of richness and complexity and you don't miss that kind of sweetness. It tastes dry, but it tastes still very round and has kept its freshness. And that's really important. So I only can encourage people to look for vintage bottles and to show how well these Riesling wines age. The vintages that you see mostly in the market right now is 2005, to start with the, the older one. That is a great vintage in any corner of the wine hemisphere on this globe. Glorious vintage. 2006, a difficult vintage. Very small in quantity, but a lot of botrytis. And um, the, uh, the concentration of the 06 is enormous. And when you look on the, on the label and you read Cabinet or Spätleser, you, you can always be sure that this is heavily downgraded. Actually, you get much more wine for what is written on the label. It's a typical example, underexpose, overdeliver. So 06 really has a rich, pungent, opulent, creamy character. It has great fruit and great acid and great density. You, you get oily uh, flavors from the botrytis, you get very quince and rhubarb flavors on the more cleaner or more less botrytis uh, grape wines, so that you find in the 06 vintage. The next 07 is very elegant. It's a very elegant, a lush and elegant, has not the top end style that 05 has got, but in the QBA is a cabinet and spade laser and even the Aus laser is a classy vintage, very elegant, lean, a vintage to age perfectly. Now 08, we are a little bit more crunchy and uh, spicy and zesty than 07. 08 has got a higher acid and a little bit lower alcohol than 07. So if you are looking for the then time light style cabinet in German wines and you didn't see it recently, go and find 08, you will have it. Now 09, we are already a year further on. 09 is just in uh, Statu Nascendi. Yeah, we are, um, uh, we are tasting and sampling and preparing the first bottlings of 09. It's highly concentrated. It's small, relatively small in quantity. It comes close to 05. I don't know whether it will be similar to 05, but it goes in the direction of 05. So whatever we see uh, from German wines, on the shelf, be sure you will never run into an off vintage. Whatever vintage, the importing agent, the distributor, the restaurateur, the retailer, or the customer picks, he can be sure or she can be sure always to have a very good vintage above average. That is so far the positive effect of global warming, as we can see it in the Mosul so far, but we haven't seen the end yet. 